So we are going to finish off this code gen topic I started uh, one month ago. Um, the going to the page number three, the agenda, the blue sections, uh, the topics were covered previously. And uh, this time, uh, topics uh, of data atomicity, cache architecture, atomic update locking, and uh, uh, memory consistency. Going to the next page. About the data integrity or atomicity. Um, th this basically about uh, for a particular data item, uh, what uh, value you really uh, read out of the uh, data item uh, or stored into that data item. Imagine a scenario where a, um, a different thread store or load from that data item. Uh, suppose the thread one store value one to variable x, and uh, thread two store value two to variable x, and uh, thread three load from variable x. Now, what value do you expect from that load? Is it a value one or value two? or uh, actually is a mixed byte of value one and value two. Um, typically, uh, this mixed byte of value one and value two can happen only the, the data item of X is misaligned. And uh, however, Java object model uh, naturally aligns all data I fields, naturally. Nature alignment means uh, two byte data item will align on at least uh, two, multiple of two address. Uh, four byte data item will align on at least multiple of four addresses. And uh, so on and so forth. Then why I, I brought up this data atomicity topic is all because uh, Java has a um, idiom called array copy. Array copy semantic is defined in terms of the array element. And uh, you can, uh, you can um, imagine for a uh, integer array, then the array copy semantic is defined uh, copy one array uh, four byte element at a time. And they, they are, because they are naturally aligned already, they are guaranteed to be uh, uh, data integrity is guaranteed in that way. However, in our runtime, when we do array copy, we actually using wider instructions to do the copy. It's more efficient and perform better. But when you're using the wider instructions to do the copy, you potentially break the data atomicity rule. Um, for example, you, when you do 8-byte uh, load and store on a 4-byte element array, the, in the hardware, it actually, in the, in the behind the scenes, um, the 8-byte load store can be turned into byte-by-byte uh, by byte load and store. That will cause uh, word tearing, or you will lose data integrity and atomicity. Um, the reason being, your eight byte load store uh, applied on a four byte data element, which maybe 
uh, aligned on four byte addresses and not eight byte addresses. That causing the uh, data integrity problem. You need to watch out for that. Uh, going to the next slide. And uh, I, I here offer a uh, more detailed uh, system architecture, uh, in particular the cache architecture details. Um, this including uh, the cache property of coherency, write back, write allocate, inclusive or victim cache. Um, uh, all this uh, concept I will go into details in the later slides. Here I just briefly mention uh, what, they, what the um, three main architectures differ or the same um, in, in these properties. For example, the iCache on um, all three platforms right now is coherent and the dcache uh, also coherent but they will differ in the write back or write through or write allocate or no write allocate and also it, the outer level caches L2 and L3 whether they are inclusive or victim they are different as well going to the next slide. Now, we are going to describe coherent versus non-coherent. Uh, here I um, have an example of instructions uh, executing on uh, processor 0 and processor 1 and let's uh, compare uh, what coherent and non-coherent uh, differ in behavior. And here the, I um, mark the processor, cache, and the memory as the different layers of, uh, uh, layers of hardware in the system. However, the memory here you can, uh, you can imagine is a outer level cache or real memory. Uh, as long as it's, it's beyond the current cache, it's fine. Um, now, on a coherent side, you can see that uh, uh, 9 is plus to x, and uh, later on, processor 1 executed 99 plus to x. If it's coherent, uh, you, can, you can see the state transition uh, in, in the processor zero cache is going, the x cache line ash value going from zero, the initial value, to nine and going to no. No here means the cache line is not going to be present in that cache. It's going to be invalidated. Why is invalidated? Because it's invalidated by the later execution of uh, X modification on P1. That means it's coherent. When you're coherent, it's automatically invalidated in the neighboring uh, P0's cache. And in the memory side, the X value is going to transition from initial 0 to 9 and then eventually is 108. And in the cache of the P1 is uh, from zero uh, to, from nine to 108. So it's coherent. On the other hand, when it's non-coherent, uh, things is going to be uh, very absurd. You, you can see in the P0 is going from zero to nine and then stay there at nine because it's non-coherent the later execution on p1 will not change the cache line in p0 although the memory here we we assuming the memory is 
the cache is right through, so memory still uh, stay with the transition from 0 to 9 to 108. That's correct in, in certain sense. But the very weird uh, state in P0's cache is 0 to 9 and then stay there because it's non-coherence, it's never invalidated. From now on, I will assuming uh, data cache has to be coherent in multiprocessor. Uh, Non-coherent data cache only exists in the past in a uniprocessor system. You can do non-coherent cache um, uh, there. You can, you can manage it later on, you push down to the memory, you can do that. Uh, but on a multiprocessor, multiprocessor system, if data cache is non-coherent, you, can, you cannot imagine how it's going to work. On the other hand, the instruction cache can be still incoherent because the instruction cache is modified very rarely uh, in typical program. However, our, in our JVM runtime, the JIT, the instruction cache can be modified uh, relatively frequently. So that situation is a little bit different for JVM, but uh, in typical other applications, instruction cache is not modified. So they, they can be non-coherent. Next slide. Uh, inclusive versus victim cache. Uh, the example here, I think that the name already uh, explains what it means. In inclusive cache on this example is your level one, level two, level two is inclusive or at level one. What that means is, every line in level one will be in level two as well. So what happened here, you, you can see here, initially uh, uh, level one, level two, all empty. And then you read X, then X needs to be brought into level two and level one. And then you, you need Y, and both X and Y are brought into uh, level two and level one, so it's inclusive there. And then you have, for some reason, X is evicted from level one, it can stay in level two still. Because level two have a bigger capacity, you evict it from level one, it can stay in level two, that's fine. But if it's still inclusive, you only have Y, level two containing Y, that's fine. Uh, then you have a back invalidation. What happened is you have a coherency traffic from the external world to level two, you invalidate, evicted Y from level two, that as long as you are inclusive cache means because you are evicted from level two, you need to do a back invalidation to level one. So if we're going to do a back invalidation to Y in that, level one, so level one, Y is evicted, invalidated, okay? Um, on the other hand, victim cache, victim cache means it only contains things pushed out of the inner level cache. So level one cache content is evicted. When it is evicted, it's going to the victim outer level cache. Uh, if you are, so initially it's containing A and uh, victim is C and D. Now level one needs, uh, the, the processor needs the, the content of cache line B and uh, conflict with A, what happened there is B is brought into level one but not brought into level two because it's victim. But at the same time, A is evicted. A is evicted, where it's going to? It's going to the victim cache. So it's going to displace the D, because D initially is LIU. LIU is the least recently used. Basically, it's going to be evicted. So A is replacing D, so it's becoming C and D. And C now becomes LIU, because it's the least recently used, because C is never used. A and B used, right? And then later on, you need A again. 
the processor need the A again, what happened? You will do an exchange. So B needs to kick out, and A is brought into the cache. So what happened here is because B is kicked out, you need to go to the victim cache, it's pushed out. At the same time, A is brought into a level one, so it's going to get into a level one. So it's basically doing a swap. And C remain at IO, okay? Um, so these two kind of cache uh, data architecture, what the, the trade-off here is, is basically bandwidth versus capacity. Uh, for victim cache, you can imagine a level two cache is, or level two or level, whatever the external level cache is a capacity expansion to the inner level cache. So you have a uh, 512 kilobyte of level two and 32 kilobyte of level one is pretty much you have the cache capacity is 32 kilobyte plus 112 kilobyte. But on the inclusive side, you, your capacity is pretty much dominated by the external level of cache. Uh, then you need to pay the cost of bandwidth for victim cache. You need to snoop for the consistency, for the coherency. You need to snoop back up more, more pathways because you don't know, for example, you have the external uh, coherency traffic coming in. Uh, to invalidate uh, A, for example, then you don't know whether the A is in the level two or level one. So it's going to, typically it's going to snoop back up in parallel um, to both cache. So if there, it, you, you will pay a higher cost of the bandwidth. Okay, and next slide. And write back versus write through. Um, uh, the example here is write back. Uh, write back the short answer, uh, short description of write back to, uh, versus write through. Basically, uh, your data is going to be uh, the external tier, external level cache or memory is going to get the value is by eviction of the uh, in inner level of cache or is as a part of the write itself. If, if as part of the write itself is write through. If it's a, a later on uh, as part of the eviction, then it's a write back. Um, so example here, basically you do a, uh, on, on P0, you do Y equal X plus one. I'm talking about the cache line containing X only here. I didn't talk about Y at all. So you can see X becoming because the P0 require X, so X is brought into the cache. Uh, zero is there. And later on, P1 uh, need X, doing X plus 99. Then, uh, as part of the store operation, the P0 cache is going to be not, is evicted there uh, because it is uh, invalidated. And uh, um, nine, P1 will contain the X value of 99 there. But memory itself is not 99 at this point because it's not evicted yet. It's not right through, it's right back. Right back means memory will, con will contain 99 later on when the P1's X is evicted. So that's right back. Right back, basically, you, the ex external level of cache or memory will get the, the content as part of eviction, not part of write. And the right through is, it's actually the, the, the other way. So the external level will get the content as part of the write. You, the 99 is going, when you, the P1 write the 99, the 99 is going to the external as well. Okay? Um, going to the next slide. And also write allocate versus not write allocate. 
So the simple short description here, description here is whether your cache will allocate the line for the written cache line as part of the write along. Because the cache typically is going to, to be uh, populated when you do read. But as the write, you, do you allocate the cache line? When you do a write along, do you allocate the cache line or not? Um, write allocate basically means you will allocate the cache line when you do write along. No write allocate basically means you you write along will not allocate the cache line. The trade-off here is you uh, uh, write is typically is uh, you you write things you don't need it uh, in the near future. That the write is uh, relatively smaller in smaller quantity uh, as to read. So when you do write allocate. The written data will remain closer to the CPU. And for no write allocate, you, your written data don't trash the cache. So that's the trade off here. One is remain uh, closer, another is you don't, you don't uh, trash the, you don't, uh, basically, you don't compete for the capacity of the cache uh, for the written data. Um, basically, your uh, the inner level of cache, the capacity can be remain for the read data. Okay, so that's the uh, trade-off here. And uh, going to the next slide. So I, we showing the cache architecture on different uh, CPUs. You can see um, for Skylake, Skylake is the Skylake X. There are a lot of flavor of Skylake. The Skylake X is the, the bigger one. In that flavor, the level three, uh, level three cache become victim cache, not inclusive. On other Skylake, uh, smaller um, Skylake, the laptop version of Skylake, the level two actually is 256 kilobyte. Then the level three actually is inclusive. For Skylake, this version of Skylake, you can you can understand why they become victim because because you if if in this flavor level three cache is inclusive, then your your level three cache capacity you can imagine you have 28 you have 28 cores. Each core is one megabyte level two, and it's, if it's inclusive, your 39 megabyte of uh, level three, most of them need to contain the, include the 28 megabyte of level two, right? Because it's shared. So basically your, your, your level three cache, the total capacity not even twice of the le total level two cache capacity. So it's not big enough. Then, then your level three cache value is, is reduced uh, significantly. So it is victim in this configuration. The power side is always a victim from his history, historically of from uh, 20 years or back. Uh, the level three cache is always a victim cache. Um, Z because they have a such big <laughs> level three, so they are inclusive. And uh, they are inclusive, and uh, the right back, right allocate is a mix. Every is uh, on Skylake is a right back, right allocate, and the power nine is a right through, no right allocate uh, at all on the D cache. So the D cache basically, you if you only doing right, the data never in the D cache. It's only made to the uh, level two. And uh, Z is all the way through is right uh, is inclusive, so it's right through. So when you do a write on Z, it's going to write to D cache, write to L2, write to L3, all the way out at one go, not as a, a part of the eviction. Um, and uh, this has this has implications to our 
um, allocation uh, G, um, G the code chain. Uh, later on, I will show you. Uh, going to next slide. And uh, now it's going to iCache. iCache is coherency and C mode X. What C mode X is? Basically, you, when you do, because in the JIT runtime, you, you do frequent modification to in relatively frequent uh, instruction modification, as opposed to C, the other program, they didn't do much uh, instruction modification. Um, so in order to do uh, code patching, the instruction modification, it, you always, you, certainly you are assuming what you modify is aligned. You can do data atomicity. If you are not data atomicity, you can, you, the, the, the instruction as a part of data, if it's not atomic, it's not integral to be written, then you certainly, you, 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 it not work. This is an assumption for sure. In addition to that data atomicity assumption, we will have two other um, uh, things here. Uh, requirement for the uh, code patching to work is you need to take care of iCache coherency because iCache on certain processors are not coherent. So, so iCache coherence is basically governing when your modification will be seen by other processors. You do the modification, your neighboring processor pick it up or not. When is it going to pick up? That is uh, iCache coherency. And C mode X is a specification, is the concurrent modification and execution. Because typically when when we do other language, the uh, instruction modification and that instruction to be executed is not happening concurrently. It's typically you compile a generated code and then you send that code to be executed. That is a two-stage thing, two-stage thing. But for, for JIT, code patching is not two-stage, it's concurrently. You have multiple threads. Although one thread is doing a modification, the other thread probably right now actually executing that instruction. So that is governing this C mode X spec, uh, concurrent modification and execution is the spec, which instruction can be modified and your program still behave. Um, this, both this, uh, iCache coherency and C mode X um, uh, spec is processor implementation specific, and our runtime need to know. Um, so if iCache is not coherent with respect to data cache, what you need to do runtime need to sync it up. Basically, when you do the modification, because here we nowadays we always assuming Harvard architecture, not uh, one Newman uh, architecture. It basically, the, you have to separate the dcache and iCache. When you do the modification in a dcache, what you are going to do on the iCache side. So you need to, typically you need to flush the dcache, doing memory barrier, and invalidate your iCache at the same time doing another memory barrier. That you can do uh, to make, make sure it is uh, coherent that way. Now, Coming to C mode X spec, unfortunately, um, on current, all the three architectures didn't have a clear definition of C mode X constraint. Even on power, a uh, uh, long time ago, but probably uh, uh, 15 years ago, I pushed it to have a clear definition of C mode X. So basically, what instruction can be modified and your program still behave. Uh, otherwise, it's always, the architecture always defined as saying if something bad happened, it, the behavior is undefined. Because undefined, usually the architecture side, they have a clear, they have an easier way out when, when they do the architecture definition, undefined. But undefined, it really means anything can happen. So 
we really need to have a clear definition of what really have a not undefined. So um, uh, right now on the power side, they have a relatively clear uh, definition. Uh, in the, actually in the next version of architecture coming out. And on um, X and uh, Z, uh, right now basically is either blind trust or try and error. You try something, oh. however, if mostly it works, <laughs> mostly it works, you, you, you do the modification, it really still behaves. Um, it's only the, the, this kind of concurrent modification and execution, the situation is a little bit worse uh, in uh, run, uh, dynamic runtime, uh, even than in debugger, because debugger typically is, debugger have this situation as well. You have concurrent modification and execution. But in debugger scenario, typically is a, the world is stopped when you do the modification. Okay, next slide. And uh, now here, basically, the cache architecture relevant to our code generation. Um, uh, as I mentioned, in the school, basically, it's saying our oh, cache is transparent. You don't, you don't need to care about cache because everything is transparent. It automatically works. But it is, certainly it's not from a, a performance perspective. For example, the cache line size, you have the, you have the trade-off of uh, uh, memory bandwidth versus uh, your spatial locality, the trade-off there. When you have 256 byte cache line, you expect a lot of data there. Uh, you are going to use, you, you are using the first byte, you probably expect to use the next byte. And uh, as part of the is brought into the uh, cache, you are going to expect to use a lot of from, from that cache line. But if you are not using a lot of from that cache line, you basically waste uh, a lot of the memory bandwidth because you, you brought in 256 bytes, but you only use a four byte, for example. Then you basically you, you, you waste a lot more memory bandwidth versus um, versus your, your, uh, what you really use. And uh, also you have wider cache line, you have more possibility, higher possibility for false sharing. And false sharing is, what, what is false sharing? Basically logical, different logical data happen to be residing in the same cache line and it can potentially uh, uh, give rise to um, uh, false contention, uh, causing unnecessary contention. If you can break it into different cache lines, then there's no contention there. That's a false sharing. This is very easily, it's a 10 times the performance if you have false sharing uh, going on. Because you, when you have false sharing going on, the data, even if you have what is called a called cache intervention. Basically, you can hand your data from your processor's cache to your neighboring processor's ca core cache. That is still, although it's faster than memory coming from memory, it's still hundreds of cycles. So it's easily 10 times the performance. And uh, um, in terms of Java, I think the, the, we have the annot Java annotation to request this data need to be in its own cache line. That, that's a, such a notation uh, to avoid the false sharing. But I, I, I don't think we, we uh, J9 currently honor, honor this annotation. We don't do that. Um, and it's also relevant to cache action, relevant to a TRH batch query. Uh, you probably know we have a TRH means the thread local heap, uh, thread local heap. So each thread, when allocate Java object, a new, create a new Java object, is typically coming out of, you allocated from the TRH, the thread local heap. Uh, 
now we in our uh, three code generators uh, we have different configuration whether the threat local hit is cleared is batch cleared, cleared or is not batch cleared uh, the trade-off here for batch clearing is you have a part length uh, trade-off because Java has a semantic. When you do new object, the object need to be initialized with zero, right? So batch clearing, clearing basically says you the whole that local hit is initialized to zero to begin with and and is doing in a massive way and uh, and platform specific way. For example, on power, we are using the, the instruction called data cache block zero. So one instruction we are zeroing the whole cache line. So you you can imagine you have a 128 kilobyte of thread local heap. You only need the 1k instruction to do the whole clearing. So that's that clearing is done by the GC. When when you when you ask for a new TLH, GC will do the clearing for you, and then you have the TLH in on 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 a thread. And when your thread is doing new object, you don't need to do zero initialization of that object because the whole technology was cleared already. So the trade-off here is you, you GC will do the batch querying using the wider instruction to do the batch querying, and uh, in the GT code you do object allocation doesn't need to uh, initialize zero by the zero by the uh, zero field zero field uh, one by one um, now you have the performance whether you can do batch query beneficially this is going to be related to the cache architecture uh, basically are you write through or write back or write allocate? It's more related to uh, write allocate or not. If you are doing D cache write allocate, and when you do zero in, because uh, batch querying is all store, right? All store, you do write allocate. What that means, the whole TLH will be brought into D cache. It will trash the D cache multiple times because the D cache is 32 kilobytes and TLH typically is 128 kilobytes. You do that clearing, your D cache was trashed four times. So basically your, all your warm data uh, sitting in the D cache is thrown away. Um, that has some performance implications for your later run. And uh, write through, not write allocate on power, because level two is much bigger. For example, on P9, the level two is 512 kilobyte. You do a 128 kilobyte clearing, that's fine. It's only one quarter of the size of level two. You still have three quarter of the level two cache uh, there for the other important data. And the level, the D cache level one is never touched when you do the clearing. So that, 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 there's something here. X and Z is because it's the right allocate is, is the, the difference here. Also SMT level consideration uh, because you have SMT level, you have four thread doing the zeroing, then you are really trashing um, because each one is 120 kilobyte, you use SMT four total to be 512 kilobytes. So I have a uh, experience on JDB 2015, you really need to tune the uh, TLH maximum size to be a smaller and actually improve performance, not to, to trash the whole level two. Okay, going to the next slide. Next slide is atomic update and locking and uh, 
interpret communication. For, for Java, um, for, or, or any uh, uh, pro programming language, the uh, interthread communication typically is going through your atomic operation, and in Java is uh, also through the volatile variable. Because volatile variable, Java volatile variable has the, uh, has the sequential consistent, uh, uh, later I will talk about that, and basically you have uh, avoid unchecked data races. And uh, uh, atomic operations have uh, the, because they are going to be exclusive anyway, um, atomically, so they can do that, that uh, uh, interpret communication. Now, you need to uh, differentiate atomic update from locking. Although they are using the same, uh, they are using the same uh, 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 primitive to achieve the goal, but they are actually in the hardware, in the hardware uh, exact behavior, they are different. Uh, uh, atomic update basically means the test set. Uh, uh, get and add whatever that atomic op operation. Um, their behavior is you do the update, you do the, for example, uh, atomic integer increment by one. When you do increment by one, uh, later on you you basically you you assuming that. Uh, atomic integer data can be handed to other thread to do another uh, atomic update. Um, but for locking is different. For locking, you, although you are using compare and swap to grab the lock, that, that occupation of that lock pretty much means this cache line should not be passed to the other processor because the other processor, even if you get that cache line, they cannot do anything about it because you're locked. Uh, so it's different from the, the test and set or get, fetch and add or whatever. You do atomic update, update there. You can pass that cache line to other processors uh, to do a further fetch and add. That different here. So how to differentiate these two behavior? Locking, locking use compare and swap, and uh, um, and uh, atomic update using compare and swap as well. How to differentiate these two two behavior? I didn't see X and Z can differentiate it. On power, we have a instruction hint. So on the compare and swap, there's a uh, load and reserve instruction on power. When you do the load and reserve, you can, you can provide a hint. You have a encoded instruction slightly differently. You have a hint here, tell the processor this instruction is intended for atomic update instead of locking. And then later on, the processor we are managing the cache line differently. When you do compare uh, atomic update, the cache line is going to be uh, easier or, or readily going to be passed along to other processor if other processor request it. But for the locking, they, tend, tend, they tend to hold the cache line for longer. Okay. So they're hinted there. Uh, just for, for Condensing locking. Catch catch line. Okay. So we can hit that. Um, you can. You still can. Do we now doing that hint right now? Well, for compare and swap, they if you use compare and swap, the hardware kind of reduces that your likely possibility on the condensing cache line. Um, 
and it tries to be smart in terms of how, how, how it, what state it pulls the cache line in. Uh, because if this cache line is not referenced by any other processor, it will load it as a, as a you know, you can write into it uh, as a state, right? As yep. it's intended, then there are copies on other processors, and it typically loads it as a read-only state. But if you see that you're comparing swap, for example, or you're actually storing into it, then it will load it and try to get the exclusive access. So there's a lot of, um, I guess, you did. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 And one of the state basically is saying you are, you, are, you are exclusive this cache line for lock or for atomic update, and then the behavior will be different. Um, it's, it, made, it's, it made a huge difference in performance for contented data, actually, for DB2. DB2, when this hint exactly was added for DB2 because DB2 log, the logging service is all use atomic update. And in other cases, they are using locking. In the past, they cannot distinguish. And uh, the atomic update basically slowed down because it's hold there or something. And uh, when this hint is added, it's really the performance improved three times or something like that. And in Java, uh, our lock is bimodal. Uh, bimodal means the lock, the Java object model, the Java object, the lock has two states. One is a flat lock, basically is only the, the lock word in the object uh, um, indicating the lock, uh, where you are holding the lock or not. And then there's a, uh, when, when the lock is Contended, there are multiple threads contending for the same object lock, and it's going to be inflated. So the, the, the lock word is going to be inflated. When it's inflated, that lock word will contain a pointer to J9 monitor object. And that J9 monitor object actually containing a reference to a thread, a P thread, a mutex object. So it's a wrapper there. Um, and um, inflate lock is wrapping that. And also there's another way of the Java utility concurrent for Java locking. It's called you going through the unsafe pack and unpack uh, primitive. Uh, that lock is, is pretty similar to flat lock. And basically it's when you have uh, uh, if you have contented there, it's going to, later on, it's going to degenerate into the p-thread, uh, p-thread and mutex and the condition variable things there. So I even didn't talk about the uh, unsafe puck and unpack style locking here. It's the, the Java monitor lock, basically you have two, two state, flat lock and inflated lock. Okay, going to the next slide. And the memory consistency. So what is memory consistency? You have a hardware memory consistency model and a software memory consistency model. So a memory consistency model basically is a contract between, uh, for example, for hardware memory consistency model is a contract between the uh, hardware behavior versus your program. And for software memory consistency model uh, is a contract between the programmer and the program, basically governing the, the behavior, what is behavior. Uh, and here, I, um, it's all because of cache. If there's no cache in the system, you pretty much, you, you don't have a memory consistency issue here. And it's pretty much coming down to sequential consistency. Because you can imagine you know cache, every CPU going to it, it converge on a memory controller to do the memory operation on the memory, 
then uh, you have a you have a single funnel through to the memory. Then it's going to be as long as your CPU core didn't reorder the memory operation, then everything is funneled through the memory controller at the uh, memory point. Then you don't have a memory consistency issue at all because it's by definition the single funnel. Uh, at the memory controller, there is a sequential consistency. Sequential consistency is easier to to understand and deduce the behavior. Now, um, the the other issue related to memory consistency is intra-thread ordering. Intra-thread basically within a single thread what the order uh, behavior, the, 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 the behavior is. Typical intra-thread ordering is, is a assum assumption for sure, and then this is true, this assumption is true on all processors I knew, except on uh, probably 15 years ago, there's a processor called Alpha by uh, DEC. They, they have some behavior uh, intra-thread ordering didn't conform to program order. They have some value speculation going on uh, in their processor. But all the, because it's good going, it, it can lead to uh, very strange behavior when your intra-thread ordering didn't conform to program order. Program order basically means your instruction layout, this order, then your behavior is conformed to your, as you see, what you, what you see in your instruction sequence, that behavior, that sequence, that ordering is your, uh, that thread observed. Um, but memory consistency model is di dictating the total ordering of total memory access in your system. Um, uh, and that can get into different model. So, so intra-thread intra -thread ordering is program order. That's an assumption. Otherwise, you have a lot of paradoxical or very strange behavior. behavior. Uh, you have a causality problem, uh, problem there. Um, uh, but Given the interest thread is program order, interest thread ordering is program order, but that thread the externalized when your access externalized and basically uh, your 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 memory access that thread memory access is put on uh, out, outside of your CPU core, that order doesn't conform to the program order. So you internally, you observe your program ordering, but externally, other people, other thread observe your access is not in your program order. That is the problem here. Um, and so, so there are different, you have different hardware commitment the, the, the memory consisting model and uh, different, uh, not different, is a, a single model on the software side. And so I'm, I'm here is talking about a hardware uh, consisting model. So Z, X and Z are TSO, total store ordering, and P is weak ordering. Uh, so now, what the difference between here is, I have an example here. So X and Y start off as zero, both variable as zero. And there are three threads doing things. Um, the thread one basically doing store one to X, store one to Y. And the thread two try to load Y into register R dot two Y and load X into R dot two X. And thread three doing the same thing, although it's going to the two, two different register. Now what you can, after this program is done, finished, what you are expect to observe. For TSO, for total store ordering, 
is pretty much means the the thread to observe x and y equal zero and one respectively. That is impossible. Thread three observe zero and one is also impossible because the total store ordering uh, memory model. Total store ordering basically means this store x and store y will be observed in that order by other processors. So pretty much if other processor can observe y equal one, it's guaranteed to observe x equal one because they cannot be reordered. So, so from, from that model, you can deduce x and y observed as 0, 1 is impossible because you observe y as 1, but at the same time you observe x as 0. That's impossible for total store ordering. Okay? But on power, it's weak ordering. Weak ordering means this store and uh, this two store x equal 1 and y equal 1 can happen any order. So any combination is possible for on power. Uh, for that three thread, the, you, can, you can observe anything. Okay, that's the difference, TSO and weak ordering. And next slide, the last slide here. Um, so now going to back to the language language consistency model. In uh, historically, uh, for C and C++, even doesn't have a memory model. Only in C++ 2011 standard, they added uh, a C++ memory model. So that, at that time, you have a contract between the language and the programmer. You, when you write the program this way, you are guaranteed to see this behavior. Otherwise, in the past that you write something in C++, um, good luck. You multi-thread it, then you, it's not guaranteed what you, but of course, it's, typically it's okay. <laughs> uh, Java, in early days, uh, they already defined a Java memory model. It's, in a, it's through a JSR. JSR Java specification request number 133 is a, so basically that's the program and then your execution. You have the, the contract between your program and when it's executed, it needs to conform a certain, certain way. So the Java language to, to have a concise description of what uh, the Java memory model means. It basically is a sequential consistent on all volatile variable sets, plus all the lock regions is consistently, consistent, uh, sequentially consistent as well. These two things put together, and uh, plus intra-thread conforming to your uh, program order. These three things together is governed the behavior of your program. And now you have the Java memory model in your hand. You have a hardware behavior, TSO or weak ordering. Your, from JVM runtime point of view, you need to guarantee your Java program will behave like J, uh, defined by Java memory model. So you need to map your code down to the um, code down to the J, JMM definition. So you need to massage your code using the right memory barrier stuff to on your platform to uh, exhibit the behavior of Java memory model definition. Although your underlying hardware model actually can be a weak ordering or total slow ordering. So, um, so your, your no matter, I, I wrote here, is no matter whether your underlying hardware is strong or weak ordering, 
your JIT compiler imminent code need to uh, behave like defined by the Java memory model. That's the contract, okay? So in our JIT, uh, in, in our JIT behavior is uh, you, have, you still have, uh, you need extra memory barrier for JVM safety. What I mean here is you have implicit data in object. For example, for a array object, you have the, in the object header, you have the object type, you have the array length. That two fields are implicit data in your Java object. And uh, for safety means if you didn't, if you didn't guarantee the order of this implicit data, you can crash the JVM. For example, if you already you initialize your Java ob array object to be length of 100, but the other thread pick up the Java length, uh, array object the length to be 1,000 because it's not ordered uh, right. Then it pick up 1,000, then it's going to be access something wrong and crash. Okay, that happened. That happened and not that uh, infrequently on power actually. And uh, we need to uh, we need to insert the right memory barrier at uh, the uh, new object uh, case in that instruction sequence after that instruction to guarantee when before you can publish your object reference to other threads. Otherwise, you can imagine you initialize it here and you publish it. You publish saying this, uh, you, you, uh, the so-called publish your object reference, for example, you store your object reference into a static field, right? So static A equal object, my new object. And a static A can be seen by the other thread. So the other thread read static A. So pick up the object, your newly created object, and then starting referencing, starting referencing that newly created object, for example, the array length. But on this creation side, although you store the array length already there, but it's not the, the, the CPU didn't uh, enforce the ordering of your store to the stack field versus your array length store. So the other thread didn't see your uh, array length store at all, so you pick up a wrong length. So what, happened, what you needed is on a newly created object before you store anything else, anything uh, global, then you need a memory barrier there to guarantee uh, the array length and the implicit data is visible. Okay, so any questions on this? Yep. <laughs> so uh, I want to thank Julian for giving an overview on all three architectures. Not that many people on the team are able to give such a good um, discussion on the three architectures and what all the subtle differences and, and where they're similar and how they actually matter in our code generators. So um, I wanted to thank you. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming to this talk. Um, stay tuned for another talk next month. So thanks. <laughs>